Hey, um, been a while since I've done anything like this, but this video is brought to you by OnlyCrits. They're not sponsoring us or anything, they're just longtime partners of the channel who've done a great job helping us out, and I uh, kinda wanted to bring attention to them. Legitimately, like 70% of the dice that I roll and use in my games are from OnlyCrits. They have amazing dice, and I wanted to get back into working with other brands and doing affiliate links, and these guys were the first on my list because I kid you not, they have been some of the oldest partners to the channel, and they have been so helpful to us and I would love to be able to help them out. They're an extremely kind company, and it would mean a ton to me if you could just go click the link in the bio, go check out their products, and maybe just buy a few of them. It helps out the channel, and it really warms my heart knowing that I'm helping out other TTRPG communities. Anyways, uh, back to the video. In 1854, Victoria, Australia, a young boy was born into this world. Ned Kelly, a name that resonates through the annals of Australian history, was not just any outlaw. He was a bush ranger, a sort of Australian Robin Hood, whose life was a turbulent journey of petty crime and full-blown rebellion against the authorities. Growing up, life was made to be unfair for him and his family. Honestly, he was constantly at the mercy of corrupt police state. Multiple times in Ned Kelly's life, he would come to blows with the police and would be labeled a criminal and which he would have to flee from them almost every day. Fast forward to 1880 and we get to see one of the most infamous events in Australian history, the year of Kelly's last stand. In a dramatic firefight at the Glen Rowan Inn, Kelly and his group of outlaws would take a fight they had no hope of winning, but chose to take the stand anyways. Clad in homemade armor that was made out of plow blades, they took on the police themselves in a shootout that lasted quite a while and ended with only one of those on Kelly's side surviving, Ned Kelly himself. Taken into custody, he was tried and sentenced to the hanging that would occur with great fanfare, and he was declared to be publicly executed. During his final trial and execution, Ned Kelly would know his name would not be forgotten, as he could hear the loud and voracious protesters demanding his release, as they did not view him as a criminal. Instead, they saw him as the last man who would choose to take a stand against an unfair authority. In the eyes of many Australians today, Ned Kelly is more than a historical figure, he's a symbol. To some, he's a hero who stood against injustice and fought for the underdogs. The others? He remains a notorious criminal. Even today, his words are quoted and remembered as a reminder of what he stood for in folklore. If my lips teach the public that men are made mad by bad treatment, and if the police are taught that they may exasperate to madness the men they persecute and ill-treat, my life will not be thrown away. Ned Kelly was a criminal, by any account, and he chose violence and harming others throughout his entire life. And yet, despite this, many people see him as a hero still. Not because his actions were necessarily righteous, no, in fact, many would declare that killing others is never a just action or righteous. But despite this, it was an action that was understood. We could see how one man would be driven to such violence, and in this way, we begin to root for him. Not because we agree with what he's doing, of course, but because we understand how he came there, and we wish for him to be able to receive justice. We expect that sometimes morality is not black and white, but instead, shades of gray. Some of the most compelling characters that have ever existed live within that moral gray. Those which actively pursue a life of individual intent oftentimes flies in the face of the protagonist of the stories that we root for. And somehow, this creates even better final dramatic moments. Famous anti-heroes such as Han Solo, Shadow the Hedgehog, or Loki leave us fascinated because their dubious nature sometimes makes the invaluable confrontations between them and the heroes the most important parts of the stories as a whole. They're characters we love to hate and hate to love, and we find them many times more emotionally compelling than the very heroes we're supposed to root for. So why are they so difficult to play in TTRPGs? I will get the obvious point out of the way that I know many people will immediately know, which is the fact that the reason it's difficult is because TTRPGs are played in parties. Parties are a concept of a group of individuals, while different, all having the same goal. And the difficulty with these types of characters is they sit in the morally gray, which typically, to a lot of players, seems to communicate that you don't have a goal, or you have a very different goal than the rest of the party. And this leads to a lot of people coming to blows. A lot of people wanted me to talk about the archetype of clerics and paladins that are morally gray because these characters are typically known as people who have very, very specific rules and tenets to live by. I mean, literally, that's part of the paladin's mechanics, after all, and clerics have to serve a deity in which, if they don't serve the deity properly, they lose their abilities. So, of course, these two classes are going to stick out amongst the rest as the ones that really are difficult to roleplay when you're morally gray, because aren't they supposed to be sticking to a very strict justice system? Well, yes. Morally gray heroes 
are difficult because they bounce in and out of stories. But that doesn't mean that they don't have a very specific rigid belief system that they go by. A lot of the times when we see these characters, it's in episodic adventures. Older TV shows such as Supernatural or Stargate would oftentimes have people who were kind of aligned alongside the heroes, but also not. They would show up in very special episodes and create a very interesting moral dichotomy, but they were always able to come to blows with the heroes. They were always able to butt heads because at the end of the day, they would leave the story. The heroes could have an issue with them, but they would be gone for a while, meaning that you couldn't directly run towards that interaction that conflict. But it's not so easy when you're playing D&D. You can easily try and have this sort of moral conflict, but when the session comes to an end, you're gonna have to be sitting there at the beginning of the next session and you don't get to just walk away from the story. All of the players are still looking across the table, waiting for an explanation, wondering, hey, why did you smite the rogue and kill him? Why did you smite the wizard? Because it cast fireball on the group. We understand it wasn't the best of decisions, but you technically caused a lot more harm by killing the wizard when the wizard only kind of killed us. He probably deserved it though, right? These things lead to very difficult encounters where you can't quite come to terms with what the morally gray character has done. But the truth is, that is not really how it works. Yes, the character may have come to conflict with everybody else, but morally gray doesn't mean that you have to conflict with the rest of the party. It's what it means in most of the stories that we think about when trying to create this archetype, but truthfully, it's actually very different. There's a spoiler warning. Where's the squirrel? <sighs> I have to address we something. We want the squirrel. We want the squirrel. <sighs> There isn't a spoiler warning in this episode. I don't need one. We're not talking about live plays. We're not talking about anything in particular. There's no need for a spoiler warning. Oh, damn! Why did it have to end like that, man? The kind of annoying anyway. You have just made yourself an enemy of the audience. Now, let's get this straight. Playing a morally gray holy warrior isn't something that is just for paladins. Of course, it extends to clerics, but also just any type of character that has a strong moral code, something they feel they cannot stray from. A sense of conviction to follow a direct ethical path. And it might sound odd for me to say such a thing, as many people would consider the term morally gray to mean muddled, in the middle, not convicted of anything, but that's actually far from true. Morally gray does not necessarily mean being unwilling to commit to anything. In fact, it very much means committing to something. What it typically means, however, is unwilling to commit to the binary that most people ascribe to of good versus evil. When we typically consider paladins and clerics, we consider them either on the good or evil scale. And to be honest, this is mostly due to the alignment chart. The alignment chart, even though it is something that has far outweighed its welcome, is still considered in D&D today. We don't even use it in the rules, but it's still something that was so ingrained within popular culture that it's hard to ignore. And so when looking at the alignment chart, what are one of the main metrics on it? Good, neutral, and evil. And people look at that neutral and they consider that to be the morally gray, but that's not true. Honestly, morally gray, at least when I consider it, is truly the person who's unwilling to believe that good and evil is so binary, so simple. It is not black and white. The world exists in gray. And this is what makes the most interesting characters, in my opinion, and what makes morally gray characters so incredibly fascinating. But it then asks the questions, if they don't believe in good and evil, what do they believe in? They believe in something else. They have another conviction. It just doesn't necessarily have to be good and evil. It could be self-preservation. It could be fighting for the weak. It could be fighting for the strong. It could be proving yourself and that you are refusing to be weak in the world that you live in. But it's something considered concrete to that individual. They don't believe that good and evil exist. And so they take a look at the material world which they live in and find something to subscribe to within that. Now, if you have to commit to something more, this means, well, you have to ask yourself some things. Honestly, if you're playing a cleric, paladin, or anybody with a faith that they believe in within the lore of the world this character is living in, 
what does that faith declare? Faith in mythical worlds can vary wildly from the binary good and evil we've been talking about. Honestly, most of the faiths in the actual lore of the Forgotten Realms are wildly different from that good and evil. You could worship a god or deity of nature, which believes mostly in the natural order, which is neither good or evil. In the world, in nature, young creatures die, defenseless creatures. But at the same time, that's part of it. If those young creatures don't die, other young will die as well. That requires an ecosystem of death, rebirth, living, death, a constant cycle. None of that is necessarily good nor evil. At the same time, you might worship a deity of governance. At which point, what does that mean? At this point, your good is representing the law of following it to a T and refusing to believe in anything else. Is that good or evil? I don't know, but that's the fascinating concept when you have deities in the world that honestly are just, well, creatures that exist to represent concepts. Individuals who are lords over a specific concept in the world, which is neither good or evil. And so if you worship them, you ascribe to whatever that concept is, not good and evil. This is truly what morally gray is and why I believe a morally gray paladin, cleric, or anybody with a very strong code, an anti-hero, doesn't have to be something that's too difficult to figure out the motivations for. Alignment complicates things technically, but alignment really shouldn't be a part of the conversation at all. And if you believe truly in the worlds that you're living in, that these gods actually did create the world, then those gods have the final say. Don't they technically have the declaration of what good and evil is? Well, no, because the gods disagree with each other in most mythologies. Therefore, every single conviction, every single moral code underneath these religions that exist in these mythical worlds are all morally gray. There is no such thing as good or evil. So it's something to talk to your DM about, but ultimately the overall concept is complicated. It's almost like it's hypocritical to itself. No, 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 wait, hold on. Oh yeah, well, you got something for me? What are you watching? Huh? Hey, you see all those alarms? That cable management. Those are my cable management, that's terrible. <laughs> However, all this conversation fails to answer a question posed at the beginning of the video. How do you play this type of character without causing issues within the party? Can an individual so steeped within their own mindset learn to look outside their own moral code and play nice with others? Should they? Should you feel like you have to abandon your character's very strong moral compass in order to be able to play nice with the other characters at the table? But the answer obviously is yes, you've come to play with other people. However, it can be very difficult to feel like you need to sacrifice that portion of your character. It might have been something very important in your backstory and something you really envisioned. And then when you came to the table, you looked at everybody else's characters and realized it wouldn't work. In some ways that can feel very unfair to you. Honestly, you should have checked with it all in the session zero, etc. but sometimes that doesn't happen. You don't have the chance to, I understand that. So what do you do with these types of characters who have such a strict, rigid moral code that they refuse to leave from and it conflicts with the rest of the party? When you're morally gray and they see the world in black and white. Well, this leads to the conversation that I had at the beginning, the very opening of this video. I talked about a specific individual, Ned Kelly, who did things that most people just consider wrong. He robbed people, he hurt people, he killed people, but at no point do many people who remember his story consider him to be the villain? Because we understand how he came that way. It's not his fault that he was put underneath the thumb of a police state. It's not his fault that the authorities constantly tried to abuse and harm his family. He fought back against a force that was robbing him and harming him in the first place. Does violence beget more violence? No, that's not how I'm saying. I'm not saying you should fight fire with fire. However, to understand that somebody was fed up with it and decided to put up with it, decided to do something with it rather than just continue to suffer, that's very understandable. And in the same way, when wanting to play these types of characters, we have to look at a certain question. Not is what they're doing wrong in that black and white binary. Instead, we have to ask is what they're doing understandable? This is the main thing that's going to get your character to work with the rest of the party. Yes, you might be somebody who is just villainous, who's murderous, who constantly slaughters everybody you come across. If it comes out when you're doing this and your party tries to stop you and you explain that you have from your village come from a place where everybody who died always came back to life. They always came back in this horrible zombified state that would then murder others. And so you make sure to kill and make sure that person's dead every time because you know if you don't, they might come 
back. Well, that's not something your party necessarily has to agree with. But boy, is that understandable. And this leads to more interesting roleplay, more interesting story decision. Because now the party's got to figure out, well, maybe they're right. And if they're not right, how do we explain that to them? How do we explain that? Yes, I'm sorry that you went through that, but that's not every person that dies. And maybe we should go back to your hometown and figure that out. And this is the issue that I find when most people attempt to play these types of characters. They hide their backstory. They want to seem mysterious, and that's understandable, but in doing so, you remove the party's one connection to understand what you're doing, why you're playing this morally gray character, and so they have no choice but just to assume you're kind of a bastard. You're just the worst. And so they're not gonna keep you around. Why would they? You've provided no reasoning for what you're doing. A morally gray character needs to be understood. They don't have to be agreed with, but there has to be some part where you look at them and say, you know what? If I were in that place, I might too understand where you're coming from. I might too have made the decisions you are. I don't agree with them, but I can understand. Them. Understanding is one of the most fundamental human connections that could ever exist. Understanding is what makes those who are so different from each other able to coincide with each other, able to work together despite having nothing else in common. Understanding is what human connection is based off of. And so in these stories, if you do not provide a bridge for understanding, what are you doing? There are many times where uh, me and my wife are watching shows and she likes a character that I just don't get. I just kind of consider them, well, the worst. And many times all she has to say is, yeah, but like, don't you understand? Like, look at what they've been through. What Look what this character has to deal with. And suddenly, I see the character in a new life. I don't agree with them, but boy, does it make them more interesting, more compelling, makes it easier to be more compassionate towards them. Toga! <laughs> yeah, we, we all know your propensity towards... <laughs> I love Toga! We know that you like villains, we know. Point is, this is how you play such a morally gray character, is you make them understandable, because nobody wants to communicate with an un understandable character. That is how you do this. And honestly, I think that's like the one thing I can give you. I don't think there's anything else to this. Just give the rest of the characters a chance to feel like they understand your character. And then once you've done that, you only need to figure out one other thing. How far is your character willing to go to achieve their goals? Because the truth is, is that if you don't know that, you're gonna end up stepping over the line. If you are able to outline very clearly to the other players how far your character is willing to go to achieve the goal that they stand by, this lets the other characters know what they're willing to let happen. But if you don't outline that, you may end up going too far. If you say, I will kill everyone to make sure they don't come back to life. And then the party runs into one of their favorite NPCs who seems to be sick with a strange virus. And you're convinced that you will do anything to stop somebody from turning into a zombie. You've just made an enemy of yourself to your party. There's not going to be any reconciling for that. That's our favorite NPC. They'll do anything to save him. That's the point of the story. And now you're trying to kill him. Now you're the villain. And maybe that's the purpose of the character, but you're no longer that morally great individual you were hoping to play in the first place. So you need to think about how far you're willing to go before you ever reach that point or else it will cause issues. I forgot to script out an, an outro. <laughs> if you did like the video, please like, comment, subscribe. I have not done a video like this in a while and I would really love to do more of these videos. I, I'm thinking honestly right now, if you do like these, please subscribe because I plan on doing, I think two of these a month, one of the live play reviews that I usually do a month, and then like a secret fourth video that's just kind of like whatever I want to make. But there will be more of these, more live plays reviews, and then like, you know, just the ones that I want to make because it's important as a creative to be able to make the things that you just feel passionate about. And hopefully you guys can support that as well. But if you want to see more of these, it is super important to please like, comment, subscribe, because that lets the algorithm know these videos are helpful and it is way more likely that you will see the next one that comes out. So. Thank you. Did I know, did anything else? Bye. Bye.